Yeah, so this is the panel on studying violence and violence studies. Um, as someone who's been in Gilman and academic life for ages, um, and, and I've spoken about violence in academia with many of you, some of you at least. What I wanted to say is that academic violence is seldom noticed. And I, I, I'm interested in the present panel because I'm very happy for the opportunity to get to know more aspects and facets of, uh, of academic violence or violence in academic life or what studies. Uh, whatever. Uh, so I, I, I'm not going to take your time, which is very short anyway, uh, but what, what I think is really, really important to remember about in, in this context about violence in academia is the class structure, which is very, very strict. And I think the violence that is embedded in class structure coming from the top, uh, but reaching far beyond whoever is found in academia, actually. I mean, it goes much further than academic life, but but it is between senior and junior uh, faculty, among the seniors, among the juniors, all sorts of all sorts of way of getting jobs in academia, but also for even below uh, administrative uh, staff and even below uh, cleaners and lawn mowers and etc. Et and we all be belong to the same community, but the classes I think are, are, are prevalent here even more than or beyond what what we find in other contexts. So this is my my opening remark for for all that. But I'm very curious to know what you have to say. So um, a starting uh, lecture will be affirming educative violence. Um, which is given by both Itai Sneer and Oriot Levy. And Itai Sneer, uh, uh, the first time I'm reading this, but is a senior lecturer at, at the Israel Valley Academic, uh, Academic College and co editor of Mafteach, a lexical journal for political thought. His research areas are political theory and philosophy and education. He is currently working on the relations between children and politics. His book, Education and Thinking in Continental Philosophy, Thinking Against the current in Adorno, Arendt, Deleuze, and Derrida, Derrida and Rancière was published in Springer, uh, by Springer in 2020. And Ori here, Rot Levy, is a teaching fellow in the International Liberal Arts Program at Tel Aviv University. His research areas are political theory, ethics, and critical thought. He received his PhD from the philosophy department here at Tel Aviv. Uh, and this dissertation is about Kant and Walter Benjamin and was a postdoctoral uh, fellow at the Freie Universität Berlin, uh, the Hebrew University and Tel Aviv University. He published extensively on Walter Benjamin and more contemporary critical thinkers in venues such as Continental Philosophy Review, New German Critique, Critical Horizons and Foucault Studies. His research in the last years concerns the problems, pro problem of freedom in a political collective context, such as resistance and revolution on the one hand, and religious, cultural, and philosophical traditions on the other hand. The book he is currently writing is titled Tradition and Critique, Habermas, Mahmoud, and Benjamin. So you decide how you do it, you but the, the time now is five minutes. There's no to... aesthetics. <laughs> no, 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 we, 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 we are too. No, no, yeah, no. <laughs> so until... Um, Quarter past. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So it's the philosophy, so the, the slides are supposed to help you follow uh, the argument. In his 1921 work, Towards the Critique of Violence, which has become one of the seminal texts in the discussion of violence in recent decades, Walter Benjamin introduces the concept of educative violence as a contemporary manifestation of what he terms divine violence. Despite extensive research on Benjamin's concept of violence and the growing interest in his pedagogical views, the notion of educative violence remains enigmatic. Our presentation, in our presentation, we aim to provide an interpretation of this concept by examining other references of a young Benjamin to pedagogical issues. By connecting the concept of divine violence to Benjamin's ideas of education in tradition and of the schooling of Geist, our goal is to comprehend the productive and emancipatory role 
that violence may have in the pedagogical context, as well as to highlight its relevance to contemporary schooling. The concept of divine violence emerges in towards the critique of violence as antithetical to mythic violence, namely to the law positing violence, which in the final account is inseparable from law maintaining violence. Mythic violence does not merely manifest the power of the gods, but also stands at the origin of every legal and political order. Its underlying principle is not justice, but force. The power to define boundaries and to accuse and punish anyone who transgresses them. Divine violence opposes mythic violence. If mythic violence is law positing, divine violence is law annihilating. If the former establishes boundaries, the latter boundlessly annihilates them. If mythic violence inculpates and expiates at the same time, divine violence de-expiates. If the former threatens, the latter strikes. If the former is bloody, the latter is lethal in a bloodless manner. The example Benjamin cites to illustrate this kind of violent action is the account of Koach and his horde, as told, as, as told in number, Numbers 16, after Korach, a Levite, assembles 250 other leaders to challenge the authority of Moses and Aaron, earth opens its mouth and swallows them alive. How might such divine violence be relevant to education? While violence and coercion have historically been seen as an inseparable inseparable part of education, such as in Plato's Allegory of the Cave, where the prisoner must be forced to exit the cave to see the light of truth. So modern education, here I am, modern education has increasingly aimed to minimize or eradicate the use of violence entirely. Benjamin is aware of this. As his essay mentions, laws limiting the powers within education to inflict punishment. However, although Benjamin acknowledges, I quote, the existence of a sphere of human accord that is non-violent to such a degree that it is wholly inaccessible to violence, unquote, he does not include education within this sphere and does not argue for the complete elimination of violence from education. He writes that divine violence has at least one hallowed manifestation in present day, in present day life. What as educative violence stand in, stands in its complete form outside of law is one of its forms of appearance. So Benjamin notes that divine violence is not necessarily exercised, exercised by God himself, but is rather defined by bloodless striking, de-expiation, and the absence of law positing. Still, he does not elaborate on how violence exercised within a pedagogical context can exhibit these characteristics. We aim to address this by taking three steps. Firstly, by reflecting on a violent image he presents of education in tradition, which implies the dismantling of the subject position, of the subject position period. <laughs> Secondly, by examining a practice of schooling outlined in Origin of the German Trauerspiel, which disrupts a fundamental structure of subjectivity and opens up the possibility for truth that transcends the ordinary process of knowledge. Finally, we explore contemporary ideas of schooling that involve the temporary suspension of class privileges, thereby carrying forward certain, certain aspects of Benjamin's concept of divine violence. Okay. Although Benjamin does not develop a systematic educational theory, pedagogical concerns preoccupy him throughout his intellectual life, as is evident in his takes uh, the life of students, his work on children theater, radio broadcasts, and in his emphasis on pedagogical aspects in the Arcade Project. An early reference to this subject can be found in a letter to his friend Gershom Scholem from September 1917, a few years prior to his essay on violence, while he was developing an outline of a coming philosophy containing the idea of knowledge transcending subject-object relations. The letter provides insights into the questions that interest us. In it, Benjamin responds to Scholem's essay on Zionist education, sorry, um, on Zionist education, where Scholem argues that a transformative education 
capable of liberating individuals from exile and preparing them for Zionism can only be achieved if educators exemplify this transformation within themselves. Benjamin is sympathetic to the notion of transformative pedagogy, yet he opposes Sholem's emphasis on personal example. He believes that such emphasis creates a separation between praxis and theory, as well as between the teacher and the act of teaching. Moreover, it conceals the concept that, according to Benjamin, should stand at the core of pedagogical discussions, teaching itself. The alternative pedagogical conception Benjamin presents succinctly and enigmatically in the letter is based on the connection between teaching and tradition. The notion of education rooted in tradition may appear not only outdated, but also inherently violent. Traditional education brings to mind notions of coercion, reducing individuals to mere links in a chain, assimilating them into a collective and compelling them to conform to its values. However, Benjamin's understanding of tradition and consequently his conception of education in tradition is distinctive and quite different from the common one, although it is not devoid of violence. He writes, Whoever has grasped his knowledge as something transmitted, in which alone it is transmittable, will be free in an unprecedented way. He who has not learned cannot educate, for he does not recognize the point at which he is alone, where he thus encompasses in his own way the tradition and makes it communicable by teaching. The metaphysical origin of the Talmudic witticism comes to mind here. The teachings are like a surging sea, but for the wave, if we take it as an image of man, all that matters is to surrender itself to its motion in such a way that it crests and breaks with foam. This enormous freedom of the breaking wave is education in its actual sense. The lesson, tradition becoming visible and free, it's rushing from lively abundance. Now, in a different concept, I explored the Talmudic connections of this but our focus here is on the central imagery Benjamin presents. And he portrays a student as a wave rising from the sea of teaching that constitutes tradition before breaking down as part of its internal motion. Clearly, this is a violent image. The wave does not break from the sea, but rather breaks back into it, surrendering to its force how can a violent image of breaking and surrendering represent education for freedom? The key lies at the beginning of the aforementioned citation. The students can be free by perceiving the teachings as transmissible and, equally important, by seeing themselves not merely as passive relay stations, but as agents who express the transmitted teachings in their own unique way. Although waves are part of the sea, no two waves are identical here. The agency of the student is manifested through surrendering and devoting herself to the movement of the teachings, as well as in the individual manner in which he revives, interprets, and gives form to them before passing them on while the next waves rise and break. The students the student generates a transformation in tradition when she reads it in her own manner, effectively breaking it, so to speak. Significantly, the student undergoes a profound transformation in this form of education, not merely in the superficial sense of acquiring knowledge, but rather transforming from a student who receives teachings from her teachers to one who actively and uniquely participates in transmitting them, namely as a teacher and educator in her own right. This should be understood as a contrast to the Enlightenment model of education, to the process of Bildung, which constructs the position of a, an autonomous adult subject who liberates himself from traditions and external authorities. Here, the great achievement of education is the devotion to the process of transmitting the teachings to the extent of their unique embodiment. This means relinquishing the position of the subject as knowledge no longer stands as opposed 
to the student or is merely internalized by him, ready to being communicated to others. Instead, the student becomes the embodiment of knowledge in the act of transmission. He does not stand in front of the teachings, rather he is involved in them, touches them and embodies them. But what are the pedagogical practices that undermine the subject position by favoring the surrender to the transmission of teachings? While Benjamin alludes to the Talmudic context in the letter, it appears that eight years later in his habilitation, he contemplates a practice that has similar effects in the Christian scholastic context and adopts it within a more contemporary framework. So, in the foreword to the, his origin of the German Trauerspiel, Benjamin criticizes the epistemological limitations of German idealism, which turned the subject's tendency towards systematicity into the fundamental axis of the process of knowing. Eventually, this process perceives truth as that which fits into the conceptual framework imposed by the subject onto the world. Such cognition, no, rooted in the subject position eliminates the possibility of genuinely knowing whatever is characterized by inherent contradictions, such as Baroque plays and the Baroque era itself, which stand at the center of Benjamin's book. Systematic knowledge always seeks to reconcile contradictions to fit them into the system. In other words, Comprehending the plays, the Baroque, and consequently also modernity at large with its inherent tensions and contradictions requires a form of cognition that transcends the subject position and the appropriation of knowledge based on the subject's own scale. Benjamin refers to this kind of cognition as truth, and we can't delve into a comprehensive explanation of this concept of truth, which is significantly different from the conventional notion of truth as correspondence. What is significant for our purpose is that Benjamin concludes his foreword by addressing the schooling of Geist, which is essential for such cognition of truth, an understanding that encompasses contradictions and tensions without attempting to dissolve or eliminate them. What does this schooling entail? And in what sense does it encompass a violence akin to that found in, edu in education and tradition, which disintegrates or disrupts the subject position. A clear instance of this schooling is the adoption of the writing method of the scholastic tractate. In the book, Benjamin describes this method as follows. Method is indirection, presentation as indirection, as the roundabout way. In the medieval tractate, the text does not lead the readers directly to a conclusion as in a typical argument. Instead, it takes them on detours through opposing positions, which are expressed through citations of scripture, church fathers, authoritative philosophers. The text becomes a polyphony, a polyphony of diverse voices. The author of the text is present primarily through the act of presentation by decontextualizing the citations and placing them alongside one another. Even when the author responds to counter arguments, his voice is not authoritative or decisive. Truth is not represented from a single perspective of an authoritative subject, but rather emerges through a multiplicity of voices, enabling its manifestation within and through these voices in a manner that transcends knowledge that is systematically appropriated by a subject. Writing or reading a tractate is a form of schooling in the sense of generating a process of unlearning the subject's position and cultivating a different attitude towards the world. Benjamin refers to this as a non-intentional attitude. The flow of thought is repeatedly diverted from its intended course by citations that are presented without their original context and without being meticulously interpreted. Both reading and writing this text are an exercise in undermining the tendency for systematic progressive reading. Benjamin describes the text of the tractate as designed to prompt the reader's thought to pause after every sentence, preventing the continu continuation of the initial intention with which they approach the text 
or the identification with the author's intention. The goal of this exercise is not a direct approximation to truth, but rather a profound transformation of the mind, a departure from the authoritative subject position seeking to appropriate truth and habituation to an alternative position in relation to it. In doing so, it disassembles intentionality, which constitutes a fundamental structure of the subject position. Giving up on the subject position is no easy task, and not solely due to the extensive duration of the exercise. It entails relinquishing a familiar, everyday, and comfortable stance that implies authority, power, and even violence, appropriating the world by imposing on it a conceptual framework, adopting an instrumental approach, and reducing it to noble objects. Desubjectifying education then responds to the inherent violence within the subject position with its own form of violence. The Benjaminian adoption of the method of the tractate in his Baroque text, employing over 600 citations, should therefore be seen as a violent act of schooling. It is designed to dismantle readers from a fundamental mental structure, opening them up to a truth that transcends the type of knowledge made possible by the subject position. That systematic knowledge which German idealism regarded as the highest form of knowledge. This form of education employs violence as a means to counteract the violence inherent to the subject position. It enables us to concentrate not only on the educational violence that Benjamin presents, but also on its connection to divine violence. The violence that cuts cycles of violence without generating new ones. By examining a significant character of Benjamin's biblical illustration of divine violence, we can gain further insight into the aforementioned examples of educational violence and propose an application of this concept to a contemporary theory of schooling in the time left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so Benjamin's biblical illustration of divine violence, that of Korach and his horde, emphasizes an interesting point. As Benjamin points out, Korach and his horde were Levites, privileged individuals. They, cha they, they challenged the leadership of Moses and Aaron, apparently in the name of equality. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord, they ask. But actually, as Moses understands, they want more power beyond what God has bestowed upon them. By challenging Moses, Moses, they seek to wield more power to utilize their privileges in decision making, thus illustrating, a, thus initiating a cycle of violence. When God strikes them forcefully yet bloodlessly, he prevents them from capitalizing on their privileges and interrupts the cycle of violence before it can unfold. This strike is not a punitive measure that rewards the wrongdoers, the wrongdoers, restores orders, or order, and preserves existing law. As an act of divine violence, it annihilates laws and breaks the cycle of mythic violence. It is not concerned with expiation, compensation, or the theatricality of the trial. In the face of its immediate and consuming presence, all are rendered impotent, all are equal. Educative violence is divine, therefore, when it goes beyond punishing bad behavior, establishing boundaries, and maintaining order. Instead, it challenges the existing legal order and the cycle of violence it generates. I skip a part here, but educative violence addresses social privileges and hierarchies, rendering them irrelevant within educational processes. The concept of schooling allows us to develop this point further pushing it beyond what is explicitly stated in Benjamin. The etymological root of the word schooling is the Greek word schole, which means free time. The connection between free time and education, the time devoted to learning and upbringing, may appear perplexing. Education is often perceived as being in contrast to free time and associated with leisure and idleness. Yet, as Jan Maschelein and Martin Simons argue in the 2013 book, In Defense of the School, a Public Issue, the free time of schooling is a time of liberation. 
Unlike private education, where access, of, access to knowledge and skills is dependent on social status, school is public by definition. The time of school emancipates individuals from socioeconomic hierarchies, allowing them to temporarily become students. In ancient democratic Athens, school provided free time, that is, non-productive time, to those who by their birth and their place in society, their position, had no rightful claim to it. The time of school, then, is not a time of efficiency and productivity. At school, time is not money. During this time, all class and social distinctions are rendered inoperative. At school, the individual is no longer rich or poor, the son of a merchant or, or of a craftsman. They all temporarily become the same thing, namely students. Thus, knowledge and skills, teachings in the widest sense, are expropriated from the elites, from the chain of familial transmission from father to son, becoming, becoming accessible to all and made public. The fundamental, I'll skip. <laughs> uh, such school is inherently democratic, anti-elitist, and egalitarian. However, it is by no means exempt from violence. Violence is, mm, never mind. Violence is, necess is necessary to wrest knowledge and skills from the grasp of the privileged elites and make them publicly accessible. But it is also, where am I? It is also imposed on the students themselves who may not willingly relinquish their familial affiliations and social positions. This violence is law annihilating in the most radical sense. Without shedding blood, it disrupts the automatic product reproduction of the social order, puts a spoke in society's will, and opens up new beginnings that are untethered by existing hierarchies. I'll stop here. Thank you.